All in the Family, Maude, The Jeffersons, comedy programs that reshaped the sitcom and some say the country. They and many others are from the Television Hall of Famer and political activist who is our guest tonight. Brilliant man, Norman Lear is with us. Sitcoms, dramatic shows, movies, the prolific man to my left has, as they say, done it all. But he's not here to blow his own horn or for us to pay him tribute. I understand he's here to talk a little politics, and that should be fun. Norman Lear is here. Norman, nice to see Roger, you. Roger, pleased to be here. Uh, I guess you're going to give a speech over at the Museum of Broadcasting. Yeah, tomorrow at noon. What are you uh, talking about? Well, I'm talking a little bit about uh, the state of the, uh, of te certainly the state of television as it relates to the state of the culture and the state of the country. Give us a preview. Is television helping or hurting these days? A lot of people, television gets a lot of heat for uh, violence and some other things. Uh, is there anything good about what television's doing? I think there's a lot of good about what television is doing, and there's a lot of bad <clears throat> about what television is doing. But I think the bad falls into that area of excess, which we see everywhere in the culture. Uh, Can you justify, some people say that Hollywood producers or record producers will do anything for a buck, say or do anything to or f to the children. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair commentary on the industry today? I don't know enough about, uh, about rap music and so forth. Uh, I know enough to know that it's a, a, a small percentage of all of American music mm -hmm. and pop music at that. So I don't think it's, uh, it represents music generally. But I don't know enough about it. I know, however, that it's excesses one can find everywhere. You're going to, under, you're going to talk a little later, I understand, about the O.J. Simpson trial. Mm -hmm. And we've witnessed all of the media, all of the p publishing uh, and electronic media uh, excessively dealing with that trial. We've had a great illustration of that. So, What do you think of the uh, fact that he's doing an interview in prime time now? trouble you? Or you... I, I think it flows very naturally from everything else that has gone on. The media just I, doesn't want to let go of this one, do they? And won't. And won't. But it's that area of excess. Yeah. It's very easy for people to look at Hollywood and talk about uh, violence, excessive violence and excessive sex. Right. I make no apology for it. I certainly make no defense for it. I make no defense because I agree. Excessive. I make no apology because I have to take it in context with the rest of the culture. And I see excess on CNBC. We saw an awful lot of coverage of the O.J. Simpson trial. It, Mostly in one it, hour. It went though. along. We did one along. hour every night. Is that it? Yeah, we did the Geraldo Rivera hour. And every night we followed it. Right. I mean, obviously, it was in the news. If there was a breaking story, it hit the news. But basically, CNBC stayed with And then Chuck Groden. Hour. Well, Groden did once a week. Talking. Once a week, uh -huh. Groden... Uh, would do a show on it. Right. Uh, that was the only, those were the two things on CNBC. Well, then CNBC displayed more restraint. Yeah, we, than we most. did uh, display some restraint. Much, uh, I had to enforce some of that restraint, as I recall, but, right. uh, but I did because I, I felt that there was plenty elsewhere. Geraldo, I thought, was uniquely qualified, being a lawyer, mm -hmm. to, uh, to handle it. And I think he handled it in a, in a dignified way with experts and so on without the. Uh, uh, salacious nature of it, right. but uh, um, Chuck was just so outraged that it was all I could do once a week. He wanted to get on and go a little nuts over the thing. Um, about 1980, about 15 years ago, you started something called People for the American Way, which yeah. to to guys like me at the time, it, we saw it as a sort of liberal, what we would call classic liberal mm -hmm. uh, or Hollywood-based uh, activist group. How did that come about? Why did you get into it? Why just start it? What was the purpose? Uh, were well, the characterizations correct and so on? 1979, 80, uh, about that time, I was watching, as a lot of people did, pieces of the televangelists that were starting to proliferate across the tube. Jerry Falwell, Jimmy Swagger, Jimmy Baker, uh, or Jim Baker, uh, Pat Robertson, et cetera. And, uh, Most of them imploded. Most, mo most have, but one is a giant TV empire uh, right now. But at, in 1980, seeing dribs and drabs of it, it was largely amusing, interesting, uh, ripe material for satire. And so I set about to do a picture called Religion. Uh, I interested uh, uh, Richard Pryor at that time and Robin Williams, both of whom had not as yet cusped. 
and uh, they were they were waiting for a script that I intended to deliver, and I sat down to go to work on it, and then started to research, uh, and really watch what was happening, and after watching for a couple of weeks, a lot, you know, 50 hours of uh, of this, I began to see the mixture of politics and religion that just scared the hell out of me. It was not my America, and so my first reaction to it was, I can. I can do a, uh, a screenplay, produce a motion picture, which might take me three, four years, perhaps miss the target. But I had a couple of ideas for what a, a, an ordinary citizen might say about what was going on. And I knew I could do 60-second commercials and perhaps get them on very quickly and hit the target. So I did one. It just showed, I did several, but, but the key one just showed a working stiff on a, uh, on a piece of factory equipment saying, something to the effect that uh, he and his family, his wife, his three kids, had all kinds of disagreements about political matters. They saw things differently, as, as, as most families, he said, might. And, uh, uh, and that was fine. They still loved each other, and everybody was fine with each other. But now comes a, a lot of ministers on radio and television, and in the mail, he said, telling us we're good Christians or bad Christians, depending on our political point of view. That, he wound up saying, ain't the American way. And uh, I did it. You mentioned a product of Hollywood. I, I, I made these. I thought they were terrific. And then I said, now, wait a second. You're going after the religious right. You're Jewish. You're from Hollywood. These are strikes against this kind of enterprise. So I flew to, uh, to uh, South Bend to see Father Hesburgh at Notre Dame, with whom I had a nice acquaintance and showed him these pieces. And he thought they were just terrific and on the mark, said something that needed to be said, and gave me the names of other mainline church leaders around the country with whom I visited. Several of them, a number of them, joined and in somebody's office, or joined in support of these spots. And in somebody's office, someone said, you know, these television spots are not enough. You should institutionalize this somehow. And somebody else said, I like what he said at the end. It's not the Ameri call it people to the American way. Now, so we did. Your your problem is not that religious people are involved in politics. Oh no, no. Religious right? people have always been involved in politics. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's on our coins in God we trust. I mean, mm -hmm. so what specifically? You say it's the religious right that you're offended by, or who? Yes, I'm by by uh, by the religious right that would, out of religious conviction, insist that the First Amendment be abridged to allow prayer in school, for example. I think a moment of silence in any kind of moment that, that allows a youngster to uh, speak to himself, herself, whatever one that child might wish is just fine. But a prayer written, organized, uh, brought to the school by some outside party representing ostensibly all religions, all people. Did they pray in school when you were a kid? I think so. I, I don't. Re I, the reason I, I don't I remember. remember that they did. I remember though that it was pretty generic, and it was, God is bigger than we are, and He looks out for us, and we ought to try to live a good life. Uh, and, and, and I, th th I think I remember it too. But the reason I, 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 I am in doubt about it is it didn't matter to us. It was trivial. We. It was a moment of, you know, to to have a little fun. To to, yeah. We didn't take it seriously. And Why if would I they have take any, it seriously today? If I, they wouldn't take it seriously today. I mean, kids, you weren't harmed by it, and I wasn't harmed by it. What's the harm? The harm is uh, that somebody is going to have to say what will be said. And if I brought my children up right, and there's, let's say, a moment of silence or no silence, there is no law in the United States of America that prevents my kid, in the privacy of his own being, his own heart and soul, from uh, praying all day long. There is no law that prevents prayer in school. There is only a law that prevents one single prayer for all children. Mm -hmm. So prayer in school was one of the issues. You, did you feel, or do you feel the religious, religious right, this, this group that you see as sort of monolithic, although I think there are, I think there are a lot of quite religious people mm -hmm. who are conservative, who aren't interested in right. pressing their views on anyone else. Would you agree Absolutely. with that? Absolutely. Let, let me say that I think the bulk of people uh, uh, who are attracted to the religious right, or on whom the religious right may count, uh, are attracted in that direction, not because they would go as far as the leaders wish them to go in that direction, 
or care to, but because the rest of us have done such a poor job reaching for them. The, okay. the progressive community has not opened its arms. Progressive is a word for liberal. In our, uh, the yes, old word yeah, for yeah, liberal. I'm, progressive. Okay. Accomplished gentleman, Norman Lear is here. Very bright man, a lot of good ideas and a lot of things to uh, kick around. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Boy, the way Glenn Miller played. Songs that made the hit parade. Guys like us, we had it made. Those were the days. And you knew where you were then. Guys were girls and men were men. Mr. We could use a man like my Miss Hoover again. Didn't need no welfare states. Everybody pulled his weight. Cheer our old LaSalle and great. Those were the days. little montage of uh, one of America's most innovative producers in television history, Norman Lear. Could you get all in the family on the air today with all the political correctness we've got going on? He said some things that were so outrageous that at the time were outrageous that people were thinking them, and you brought them out and put them in everybody's mm -hmm. living room and said, let's discuss it. But I fear today that there's been such a clampdown that you can't say anything about anybody without somebody filing a lawsuit. Well, I, I, I wonder. A year and a half ago, I did a show called 704 Hauser, right, which, which took was, place. Uh, Archie's right house but with a black right. family right a, b a black liberal who named his uh, son after his uh, idol of idols uh, I've just lost the great black uh, liberal uh, uh, Malcolm or, or no no, no uh, justice Martin or uh, oh justice uh, Thurman uh, Thurman yeah Marsh, uh, Thurgood, Thur Marshall. Thurgood Marshall, Marshall. Thurgood Marshall, Thurgood Marshall. Okay, yeah. uh, it goes with the territory yeah, right. to these two guys <laughs> sitting around uh, Thurgood Marshall and the kid grew up to be much more in the image of Clarence Thomas. Right. Uh, so we had all of that wonderful black conservative liberal argument that's going on today. Why did the, that show the, not the, make it? The black uh, uh, conservative son also was in love with a Jewish girl. So we had the wonderful black and Jewish and black and white. I wake up every morning of my life, read my newspapers, and think, oh, God, why aren't we on the air now? If only we were on the, on the air to comment about all of this to get some of the humor that exists in everything in life out of all of this that is now so seriously uh, agitatedly considered. Yeah, I mean, I, I think people overreact, and, and, and there's been a sort of lack of freedom of speech today that you, you broke through the barrier, and now we're back in the bottle or something. I'm not sure. Do you have I, any sense of that? I don't know. I mean, the show was was terrific. The people who saw it loved it. It wasn't that far down in ratings in a bad time slot, the network kept telling us. We, and we made six. They aired four or five. They didn't air the last one or two. So, was America not ready for a black conservative? You know, I think basically America is so bottom line, short term oriented. Certainly network television is. The name of the game is give me a, uh, uh, a hit at 8.30 Tuesday night and every other value be damned. And as long as that's the case, we were not that fast a hit. Perhaps we needed to become an acquired taste. There was no time for that. You did a show that I always thought should have been a hit because I produced it off Broadway, Hot El Baltimore, with Kermit oh, Bloomgarden. Did you? I Kermit and I produced that show at the Circle in the Square downtown. Uh -huh. You'd forgotten yeah. that, but that's 20 years ago. You took that and turned it into yeah. a television uh, sitcom. And that one didn't make it either, but it ran off Broadway. I think Kermit but, yeah, I'll tell you what was different. Years. I'll tell you what was different about it in those days. It ran, it was bought for 13 weeks, and it ran 13 weeks. The salesmen weren't selling it. They had a hard time selling it. You, you, you know the place, yeah, you know, know who the, the characters, set of characters were. Two gay men, two hookers, two, I mean, it was, uh, and very uh, funny and very human. Right. The, the, the human It was family. actually an American tragedy in a sense. These were lost people living mm -hmm. in a hotel that was about to be torn down. And, right. And uh, but out of that tragedy comes a lot of humor. And uh, it was so it was made uh, for ABC when Michael Eisner, right. now running Disney, was running that network. Right. And to his everlasting credit, and executives don't run things this way today. He loved the show so much. Told me after four shows it would probably never get to a 14th episode, but never missed a taping. Well, you know that play came because. I was uh, partnering with Kermit Bloomgarden, who was very near death at that time. He uh -huh. a great Broadway producer, and 
He had done Equus and uh, Diary of Anne Frank and some wonderful plays. But Kermit and I were close friends, and I was a young television right. producer. And he said, go find a play you like, and we'll do it. And I went to a place up at about 80th on the west side, three-floor walk-up. Right. And I found this play. Judd Hirsch was the desk clerk. Uh -huh. Conchata Farrell was in it. There were some others. And I called Kermit, and I said, I found a great play. And Kermit at that time had one leg cut off. He'd lost his leg in a, they gave him bad mm -hmm. blood or something. He came over and hobbled up three flights of stairs on crutches, saw the play, said, you got great taste, it's a great play. We moved it to the circle in the square in the village about three or four weeks later. Uh -huh. And that started the run. So you and I have similar tastes, even though we come I from love that. Place. It was a great, <laughs> great I play. Think, I think if the longer we talk, we might find a great deal of things we agree <laughs> Actually, find. the longer people talk in this country, the better <laughs> chance they have of finding some things. Uh, going back to the, to the uh, political situation today. Now, in 1980, Ronald Reagan was coming in as president. That probably scared you progressives, if you will. Uh, yes. Because here you had Reagan. I don't mind being called a liberal. It's just that you guys yeah, I know, have made yeah, I know. such you, a well, dirty see, word of it. See, but you guys you know, have you, made it, you, you guys have made a dirty word out of arch conservative. Everybody's either an arch conservative or a moderate. I don't, feel, no, I don't feel that way. I feel you? that way about stupid conservatives <laughs> and, and smart conservatives. Okay. You know, there's nothing wrong with conservative. There's something vastly wrong with the kind of, and you know stupid yeah, conservatives. I know too. stupid conservatives, but I know a few stupid progressives, too. So, yeah, I mean, reflexively, there, are stupid, there are stupid people at both ends. We would both agree, yes. right? Have you gotten any more, and this is going to be a terrible admission if you do it, but <laughs> have you gotten any more conservative as you've gotten a little older? I have, I have for a lot of years described myself when asked as a, as a uh, bleeding heart conservative. I think to care about the First Amendment and the Bill of Rights as I do, as, as, as People for the American Way does, is tremendously conservative. That is I, not a liberal position. Okay, I've got to see, we found something else we agree on. Stay with us. Norman Lear is here. We'll be right back. In my day, nobody went around calling themselves Chicanos, Mexican Americans, Afro Americans. We was all Americans. After that, if a guy was a jig or a spick, it was his own business. <laughs> <laughs> now, you couldn't do that today, I don't think. I think you'd have a problem. I had, think had it never been done, could you do it now? I, it, you're, I, think I don't know. I, I don't really know. think the world's changed. You know what's interesting? Uh, uh, the Business Enterprise Trust, you and I talked on the phone, I guess a year or so ago, because mm -hmm. uh, CNBC uh, was covering this event. It was interesting because you were sort of in the room with a bunch of real business moguls. Now, I know you're a business mogul, but I also know you're... Uh, political activist and so on, and sort of there was a little bit of a disconnect because most people see these business guys as sort of conservative types. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the business trust. Well, first, let me say, I, no disconnect at all. This is what we were talking about a moment ago. There, the more you talk, the more you understand how yeah. much yeah. we might agree on, on, on well, the Well, you and I both things. a friend, uh, Jim Burke, who used to run Johnson & Johnson. Well, the, the business enterprise trust would not exist without Jim Burke. I had this notion. That, uh, that what we see in the press is largely uh, uh, negative business stories. Right. When this started six, eight years ago, uh, most of the stories were negative. That's when we were reading about Boski and Milken. And, I mean, all of the stories were negative. Today, still, the American business is, a, uh, is an unheroic, to put it mildly, character in the literature of television and, and so forth. And some of it deservedly so, but there are true American heroes in business. Jim Burke was one when he was running Johnson & Johnson in the Tylenol situation and was a big hero. And I talked to Jim about starting something that would honor those companies that were good for everybody, that were, in a sense, in Jim's words, doing well by doing good. And we started the Business Enterprise Trust. He's chaired it from its inception. We have some wonderful, uh, giant American business people on the, uh, on the board. And we honor five, November 14th is our next, we honor five businesses each year that are functioning in ways you wish all of American business were functioning. Long-term thinking. Now, is this social do-gooder stuff, or no, is, it, is it, it, what is it? it? We do not honor altruism at all. We honor companies that are being eminently successful but doing things that are, are interesting and, and uh, uh, courageous helpful. and helpful to 360 degrees of the constituents. Why, do, why does Hollywood paint businessmen? They're always fools and morons in, in, in Hollywood, in movies and in plays and in, 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 in television shows. Why are the businessmen always dumped on? I mean, 
I, I happen to be a big fan of businessmen. As I yeah. often say on this show, I never got a job from a poor guy. So I have no problem with rich people, and particularly <laughs> corporate executives, because it, it never bothered me. But some people, and I think sometimes uh, your progressives, make this class warfare argument that, that, that the rich people are somehow bad people, and, and uh, I, I think that's wrong. Well, I think if, if one did some research, one could find lots of examples uh, on the other side. But let's assume it's, you, and you yeah. are right. I mean, to, to I'm, I'm sure. Well, that's part of the argument. I mean, I, I'm sure what you're talking about outweighs the other. Mm -hmm. But in drama and in, certainly in comedy, you tilt at the establishment. You mm -hmm. don't make fun you make fun of power and and uh, and achievement and status. But couldn't there so be on. maybe one, even a drama where the businessman's honest? I don't think I've ever seen a drama where the businessman was honest. Well, I would suspect, if one of the major corporations with the money to spend to put shows on television, came along and said, "Let's take the Auchincloss books, for example, where businessmen are heroes. Right. We want to do a series that elevates and and respects business." There would be writers everywhere. So you ought to do that because you could get away with it. Being a progressive, if I were to do that kind but of a show, they'd say, oh, oh this you're guy. Th you're throwing it at me. I'm suggesting that the business people that we they know have to and step respect, up. if they were to step up and order it, supply, right. so that we'll, supply we'll, would we'll be We'll sponsor that kind of a show. We'll yes, put we're looking money. for it. Right. We want it. Yeah. I think businessmen, by and large, have been hammered around so long, they figure if they can keep their head down, that's probably the best. <laughs> that's the best they can get out of it is a draw. Uh, yeah. By not being recognized, so they sort of stay away with, uh, away from it. What are what is uh, uh, people for the American way? What are they up to these days? Where are they going to resurface? What are they working? I'm glad you asked the question because we have just uh, found a uh, we, we lost our leader, uh, Arthur Kropp, who died about ten weeks ago, and uh, Tom Andrews, two-term uh, congressman from the state of Maine, has just assumed the presidency of People for the American Way. He's a dynamic, exciting. Uh, Patriot. I mean, he's a wonderful man. I can't wait to see how we develop uh, in time with Tom's leadership. Can liberals and conservatives reach, without getting into the argument of uh, censorship, can they reach a, uh, a community standard even nationally saying, look, singing about killing cops or, or raping women or doing, this is not right. We, we, we're not going to, we're going to expose businessmen who promote that for profit. Uh, or is that, in your judgment, over the line, nobody's business, and we shouldn't get involved in it? Let me tell you a, 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 an area that I think could be a greater service. If we were to take the violence, and this requires Democrats and Republicans uh, right. to understand and agree, if we were to take the violence out of campaigning, out of all the negative campaigning that is soon to erupt and, and, and wash us floor to ceiling, wall to wall, as it did uh, a few years ago. I think we would be limiting a lot of the violence that is done to the American mind and to children everywhere. But you can't that, compare that, a negative political spot to a kill the cops song. Right? I can, I can, yes, I can compare in my heart and in my mind the destruction and diminishing of authority figures everywhere to any kind of violence. On, on, uh, which is made up in fantasy on, on in the real world. There are no heroes because we punish and demean people running on either side of the aisle in every election in the country. Let, I me, think give you the, the, let, let me give you the other argument to that. Ninety-some percent of the incumbents get reelected. That's the reason the people are interested in having term limits. Mm -hmm. And so in a campaign, if you decided to take some of the money you've made and run for office, to unseat an incumbent, you would have to do ads pointing out that person's weaknesses as well as your strengths mm -hmm. to be able to get there. And under the First Amendment, you would have the right, because you earn the money, to say whatever you want. Right. You think we should do away with that? Or, I mean, if you're not going to do well, negative the, ads, you're not going to win. These, these incumbents, mm -hmm. uh, what's left? For, are they respected? Tell me who is respected across the board. Sam Nunn, and he quit. Very few. There you, the, you, you'll, you'll name a couple. But yeah. by and large, we don't have many respected figures because they've been destroyed and they, by destroying each other. That, I think, is the greatest violence. The, the percentage of films that deal in violence is very small compared to somebody, everybody's gone over those statistics about the top 10 grocers and so forth. Right. They're never in that category. Right. 
and I don't say it to excuse, because we shouldn't excuse the excessive violence. But I'd like us to look at the excessive violence that's done by normal people, established people. It's like anti-Semitism or racism. You know, if the Ku Klux Klan is a tiny percentage of the country. They're off here. If racism didn't exist in the hearts and minds of good people, this is Archie Bunker's situation. We wouldn't have any problem at all in this country. Norman, I got to wrap it up, but I guess if you I and I talk, if you and I talked long enough, we'd probably found so much that we agreed on that your supporters and mine would question I'm both sure of us. Of it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. We'll be right.